Well, the story so far, for what it's worth, um, hasn't changed much since the last video. So we'll just uh, do a quick trace of the line because that seems to be helpful. Dark blue are checks. We're running up here. No big defects there. Cutting up here, we got some checks. These are the other color for checks uh, that are caught behind enemy lines. That's terrible. They won't be recovering fully. Uh, same thing over here. But here it looks like there's room for a breakthrough. One I would have liked to have made. Why didn't I? Good question. Um, it would have involved uh, bombing these and this as well, right? Would it? No, not quite. Uh, would have involved bombing these. One of the things was, hey, there was an attack helicopter in the way and I passed it by because of that. But then I ended up neutralizing the helicopter in another attack. And this actually probably would have been a very wise attack to make. Just to try to clear this up. But again, my chances of actually clearing things up on one attack are really low. Because the multi-hex battle issue um, the fact that it, it, I can only do one round of it, which is what I fucked up here and why that was actually successful. So, eh, maybe I'm for the best not having hit it. We cut up. Still got some weird shit going on over here. These guys aren't going to recover. These guys obviously uh, are. Well, maybe not. One, uh, they're, they're too far away. Too many movement points to get down to the road so they're not going to recover. So some things where it looks like I've got a line of supply, I don't. Just because I've got to get to the road network relatively quickly. Big, big ignore here. Soviets have decided, hey, let's punch through this way, let's punch through that way, let's forget about that nasty terrain. It's okay. Um, this is really due to a withdrawal by NATO more than anything else. And then cutting up here, we gained a lot of ground here on the 5th Corps map uh, due to an incursion that we made. And that's why there are some units back here that are behind enemy lines. Then we swing down tight and sharp to Castle. We got a little bit of a breakthrough over here. Uh, I'm not even sure these guys are in supply. Which means these guys may not be as well. Well, they will be because they can cut down to here. But what about these fuckers? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see, but uh, there's definitely some risk there. Uh, luckily, it's kind of cheap terrain. Nope, no roadway through there. So one, two, three, four. Yeah, I'm not going to be in supply with these guys. So the Soviets are going to start having some serious problems due to outrunning their supply. I thought this would be safe. Another reason why I probably should have attacked there, but again, I wouldn't have cleared the issue. It, uh, it would have been really unlikely to, to succeed. Ah, uh, cutting down, nasty terrain in front of the river, and then down to Hanover, where again, we got a big ignore. Don't want to fight our way through there. But we get to Soviets trying to break through up here near, what is that? Nienburg, never heard of it. And then along here facing Brits that are kind of gonna be tough to deal with. I've got some additional Brits heading down to try to reinforce here as well as over there into the gaps. These guys aren't gonna make it in time. That's kind of the problem. Things are gonna be uh, breaking open before they can get there. Sure, I could have ran them a little harder. Maybe it would be worth it, I don't know. It, it's really hard for me to keep a, a, a good grip on everything. Do I wanna do I wanna do that? How far would they go? I mean there's no defect right now. I'm gonna leave it as it is and let those guys recover a little. But it, it definitely would have been a possibility to push them uh, deeper into place. Likewise, uh, okay, we continue down. Germans holding the terrain here. 
And then a little bit of the river line they still hold. They got, like, they're broken into is basically the problem. And I'm trying to withdraw, but not having much luck there. Over to Hamburg, which is still something of a fortress, although this area is cut off from supply and has been for a while. And I got some uh, Dutch coming down to reinforce as well. Remember, I did, found out that the, uh, the two new maps are on eight hour turns supposedly, which is why the reinforcements take longer to show up on those. Uh, the Volhers set, once it was finally released, and I, I think Kerry Anderson actually was doing it officially, printing the counters for it and whatnot. Although, some, oh well, officially for Volhers. <laughs> but but uh, maybe someone somewhere uh, made, them, made them stop. I, I know that SPI Wrecking Yard shut down as a whole. It may just have not been worth the effort any longer for him. Um, but that, that rule set that goes with those counters, and you can still print out the counters on your own or send them, you know, do them somehow. But uh, that rule set in the updated counters takes everything into account and gives you the correct uh, entries and everything. I'm, I'm just working off of one that came out in 2014, and things didn't get finalized yet. I think. They got finalized in 15, but I'm not positive of all that. All right, that's the story so far. I got a lot of counter flipping to do, and uh, I might, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm processing the counter flipping in my normal fashion. I'll just do that one because it doesn't hurt anything. Um, I caught a German helicopter that did not withdraw, that probably should have, at least made an attempt to. I know I'm going to save it and everything, but if I had made the attempt, seven, eight, nine, it could be behind the lines and safe, right? Uh, I don't think it impacts anything if I do move it, so I'm going to make the roll for it. But, well, it wouldn't have made it anyway, which is cool. Uh, this it kind of highlights uh, the whole situation of uh, how hard it is to keep track of everything in something this big. Now, uh, I'm able to do that with the gunpowder tactical games that I like, right? <laughs> I'm able to keep track of uh, everything. Everything tends to be fairly limited in its, in its uh, locale. You don't have things like 30 hex ranges to count from stuff or to measure with your little piece of paper or whatever. And just keeps things easier. Now, smaller operational games, let's go to the smallest type stuff like No Retreat that handles stuff, you know, in the same kind of complexity in terms of like the decision making and everything, but you have. I don't know, maybe a dozen pieces on the board or whatever. Uh, it just doesn't feel very exciting to me to play something at that, at that, uh, at that level. You know, it, it's like there's just not enough of a story happening. Yeah, the big, big parts are, are showing, but I kind of need that little to big uh, view, right? that I get with the with, with this and and with the um, and with the big tactical games that I play when, when I play them. I know some people were talking, uh, hey, you know, could you play this with like three people on a side? And yeah, you could. Uh, and, and and what that would do though, the whole picture would still be there, but I wouldn't be getting it. I'd be getting that little slice that I'm looking at. You know, if I let's say I'm doing a map. You know, let's say it's five people on a side or something, and I'm in charge of one map. That would be where all my focus is, and the inner joining and whatever. But, you know, whatever section that I'm in, in charge of is where my focus is. That makes the task easier, but it also takes away that broad sweep that I want to see and I want to be making decisions on or uh, being able to analyze the whole picture. And it's just... 
I, I think there's no sweet spot for me for the operational stuff. Now, it may be why I like North Africa, because <laughs> the front is very narrow, <laughs> you know, and it's naturally decided in that way. And we'll, we'll see with Dak. But I'm really terrified of, because I have bought some of the bigger OCS East Front type games. I didn't buy Case Blue. I, I, w I would have. <laughs> like, once I realized, yeah, I'm into OCS, uh, enough that I was buying a lot of it, um, I, I, I would have I probably picked up Case Blue. But I'm really not sure that I'm into that, the, those big things, for the same reason that this is a struggle. You know, I, I don't want... I don't want that kind of difficulty in seeing the small scale stuff. We'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But anyway, I just wanted to come in with that, that note. And by the way, yes, it's still Christmas Eve. <laughs> oh, various nastiness. We're running into areas over here. This guy was fine. This guy was fine. But down here, where the movement allowance is not sufficient. So this guy, two, three, four, five, six, can make it to the road now. Fine. These guys cannot. Um, and I'm just trying to see, but yeah, I don't have a road nut going across here um, any longer. So this guy doesn't have any pathways to make life a little easier. And this guy was barely in, in connection. So not everybody who looks like they're part of the line is going to be able to trace supply. This means I withdrew not far enough. Hey, too bad, man. You know, I, I, I just feel like errors like that are just going to happen to me. And I've got no, you know, it's so easy to let things slip out of the way. Hey, I'm forming my front line and everything. And then when you look at it, you're like, yeah, it's not quite good enough. That's one nice thing with OCS, right? The supply is explicit. So you're not like, you can kind of eyeball and say, well, I got a dump near there. Also, units have their internal supplies, which helps. But that's sort of reflected by the friction points being accumulated <laughs> that you don't recover. So it all, all kind of works the same. The one thing that doesn't work in this game is there's no representation of what are really hard losses beyond, yeah, they're so bad that you're no longer functioning. You're either pretty much fully functional, but in danger of collapse, or, you know, in, in, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, your strength points remain the same. Now, if you look at OCS, though, it handles things the same way, honestly, except for the very largest of units. Small units can take losses, but when you're looking at, like, you know, you're usually looking at stacks in that game. In this game, you're not really looking at stacks for the defense. You're looking at individual units, which have a hell of a lot of staying power uh, against, against the attacks that are being made. Of course, the turns are relatively short in time, which I keep pointing out. That, you know, yeah, you're abstracting away a point where, you know, like a unit has taken 20% losses, is maybe shakier in morale and all that. All that's not really being represented very well. There's nothing to, to handle that. But every game abstracts some things away. It's odd for that thing to be abstracted away. We, we're not used to that. And that's where the discomfort is. But I think in comparison to other designs, this actually holds up fairly well. What kind of errors, the little mistakes that I make, they don't even out. Because remember, the defender has to be absolutely perfect. Any defect that the attacker sees and, and, and takes advantage of can collapse the line. Whereas, and yeah, you can make up for some of that by, you know, if you, if you have enough troops by putting a second line of defense in, whatever, sure. There aren't enough here. <laughs> Not yet. Um, whereas an error that the attacker makes could be a big deal in terms of an attack, not, uh, an, a salient not being able to be pushed forward as much as you might think. But 
Yeah, I've, I'm finding more and more places. So here, obviously, I'm out of supply. But this guy was out of supply because he could only go through this hex, which cost him four movement points to begin with, and then no other way out. Yeah, he looks kind of in an exposed position, but he, I, he, when I was calculating out, hey, how do I want to defend this, he looked like he was in an okay place. He kind of is. He's not in that horrible a position. He's just out of supply, which isn't that terrible in this game, luckily. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, was, I worked my way across, still doing one side at a time, etc. It's not just a defender who can make mistakes, though. Let's make that clear. Um, I decided to start looking at uh, some of the Soviet situation. And this piece here, now I've already resolved him. He incremented his number and flipped over, which is how you handle that. But he would have to trace supply here, three, four, five, and then there's nowhere. <laughs> it's really hard to trace supply in this game. And again, it's not as big a deal as it is in, you know, you know, some of those games where it's just like, yeah, you can trace an infinite amount and you're fine and whatnot. <laughs> but uh, it is tough and supply is a real concern. And the Warsaw Pact may have overstretched itself in a lot of places where I wasn't even thinking that they were. Like there are places like, well, I noticed this where I thought, hey, I'm in supply, I got my route back, whatever. Yeah, there's a little bit of road that I can't connect to. I'm screwed, you know. Um, and I didn't connect up here. So I'm gonna have to worry about trying to rectify my supply situation as a major concern for the, for, for the Warsaw Pact. And, you know, it, it's just been out of mind because for the first four turns, they're all operating off of internal reserves and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, and, and it's not horrible. I can still launch attacks and do shit and everything. My units are still pretty functional because the abstraction, right? It's not, it's not causing losses to the strength points and whatnot, but it will require greater recovery periods. Supply considerations are worse than I thought. They're, these are tricky to get supply. It's just the road is far away. You get outside of those black triangle connections and whatnot, and it's really not easy to move through the terrain in order to get your supply. What I'm finding is I'm relying on supply off the Bayor map, just as I relied on the Bayor map to get me where I wanted to go on the other map. Again, there's no consolidated victory, at least in the version that I have. And it would be really hard to make because, you know, if I look at how far I've gotten on the Bayor map, or uh, I'm sorry, on the North German plane or on the Bayor map, that's reliant on the successes I've had on the Fifth Corps map. And really, this is the key. This is what's important, is how far have I gotten the fur on the furthest east map? Because, and I, I think I've done pretty well, <laughs> honestly, for the initial stage of the fight. Not for the final. Now, on some of these other maps, though, I look like I'm doing a hell of a lot better. So, yeah. All right, uh, I got it done. Oh, it's still daylight. <laughs> which is definitely helpful. Um, Warsaw Pact has significant supply issues in a lot of our, oh, forgot to deal with these entirely. Rot route. Most of these are fine, these guys are not. Just a little cluster there I gotta deal with, uh, but these guys are you know, clearly out of supply. The air drop, these guys are not close enough but the roadway is still there, so <laughs> um, I have this. Actually, all I have to do, no, I can't get to this roadway. That's not good enough. But can I get to this one? One, two, three, four, five, five. Yeah, I can. So that one should be reduced. I'll do that right now because if I don't do that one, I will forget it. But this little cluster I can remember. 
But yeah, their supply situation is not optimal. Um, you know, you look at something like this and you still have to count it. Well, here I can make it to the road and make it back. That's fine. But in a lot of places where it looks like I'm not incurring, I'm not incursioning very far. Uh, I'm not pushing deep behind enemy lines or anything. You know, it's not like these couple of guys. Yeah, I can kind of see it. Sure, I pulled them back to save them and get them back in supply. I didn't succeed. Uh, it's it's hard. It's hard for me to adjust. The game has. I don't know, it just sort of the eyeballing doesn't work. It's like, yeah, I got it. Yeah, the train sucks. And getting to this road isn't good enough. I have to get over here. So it was just a little out of range in, in something like that. But some of the other stuff, I feel like I'm really, you know, like here, well, this guy's fine. Um, actually, he's not. And I don't think he recovered because this road is interdicted and this road is interdicted, which means I have to walk quite a ways, three, four, five to here. I'm not going to get off this road. So, yeah, this guy looks like he's in good shape, you know, roads all around and everything. Eh, not quite. I haven't, for the same reason that the U.S. unit is not in supply, where, where you intermingle with the enemy, it might, enemy, it might be uh, difficult. Anyway. Warsaw Pact ends up getting air superiority anyway, no fog, uh, which is fine. I got artillery. And for the EW points, I don't know, it's kind of hard to, to assess. I mean, I know what the numbers are. So in most areas, Warsaw Pact's a little over 10. For some reason, they've got a lot in Hof Gap, but so does NATO. Fifth Corps. Neither side has many. So Warsaw Pact is lowest on 5th Corps in North German Plain, which just seems kind of random to me. Um, whereas NATO points in 5th Corps are also at North German Plain are also at the lowest, which just feels weird. Like, are you not expected to fight on these maps? Is that, is that what, what's going on? I, I don't understand. It's not like one side or the other is getting the jamming advantage. Uh, I, I, I would kind of expect NATO to, I, I would expect Warsaw Pact to start off with big uh, electronic warfare capabilities. They actually increase as they go, and NATO's increase as well, but it's not like one side or the other is getting sort of a, an electronic warfare advantage out of it, which feels wrong to me somehow, I don't know. Uh, at least if I consider it as electronic warfare, it might mean other things. It might mean things like tactical surprise and whatnot. Whatever, you know, like it does not seem to be simply the capability of jamming the other person's abilities, but I don't know. I take things as what they're labeled as and the system labels it as electronic warfare, but I think it may be covering some other stuff just to make some sense. But the numbers don't really make sense to me. It's like, yeah, okay. So neither side really can conduct offensive operations for some reason on the fifth core. And sorry, uh, it was the North German plane that was weak. Not, that's up here. Yeah, North German plane is the other one which neither side has very many. But the big thing is I got the air points and it means that uh, the few NATO uh, airdrop units aren't coming in, which is a big deal. Now, I could bring them in on the roads, and that might be worthwhile, to be honest, mainly because I'm not, I'm not seeing a capability for an offensive operation. Well, I need the light on so I can see those. Anyway. Uh, as soon as I flip those counters over, I guess we're ready to rock, but I won't be because I got to do some raid tonight and then it'll be dark and I really don't know if I want to play when it's dark. I feel like I'm grinding down on this game in terms of like, all right, the big advances have been made. 
surely, surely I'm going to have a hard time moving forward from now on because, you know, Soviet capabilities are, are stretched to their, their limit in terms of supply. There's more NATO troops on the board. We've got, you know, the French coming in. <laughs> a little late, but okay. Uh, the fuck are all those? Wow, lots of Soviet, like, much, much later, I guess. I didn't realize. I thought, I'm going to have to look and make sure I'm doing that right. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, and over here, sure, we got the Dutch and the Poles coming in. I don't know that we really, like, we have, we have the need for them. In terms, of, uh, in terms of the Soviets, they need additional forces to move into place and replace the units that have been fighting too hard. For the Defender, the costs on the Defender generally are, you know, you lose the unit because the ground you were holding was too important in a lot of cases. Or, well, maybe you get a little beat up and you're in the back and you need more units to charge up. But the defender certainly needs more forces, you know, to, to cover, the, cover the territory. Blanketing this would be really, really powerful. Um, so maybe getting the Dutch up on the line there. Although I seem to have kind of relegated them to the center for some reason. Because that's where they were needed at the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I just feel like it's going to start getting to be too much of a headache without enough kind of neat shit happening. And by neat shit, I mean breakthroughs and whatnot. It's kind of like, you know, the guy who plays the Barbarossa scenario, well, not the Barbarossa itself, but who, who plays like the East Front, runs it through Barbarossa and is like, yeah, I'm done now. But it's not like NATO is going to get a big counterattack capability. Uh, they might, although even in the NATO game, you don't see it. But they might get possibilities to make some sort of defensive attacks as if the Soviets overextend too much. And there's things like these paratroopers that I really should, if I had forces, I would, I would allocate them to it. But I kind of don't have any. Maybe the French can do that. I don't know. They're on their way. They're on their way to deal with that helicopter, at least. And clearing out other stuff is of great value. Anyway. Off I go. I just like to catch the moon. Oh, we lost her. What's going on? There it is. Um, I would, you know, anytime I saw the moon in a nice view like that, I would run downstairs, grab my wife. Sometimes she'd be like, I don't want to see it off anymore. <laughs> but uh, usually she would come up and, you know, eh, that kind of thing I miss, I guess. I don't know. Just sort of like the regular everyday shit. Uh, well, here we are on Christmas Day. I couldn't go shopping if I wanted to. It's a weird thing. You know, when I... Um, I don't remember when, but at some point in my life, all the supermarkets and everything were open every day of the year, Christmas, whatever. And that felt like kind of a new thing. And my, my mom was really kind of excited by it in the sense of, look, you know, people have to go out and grab something. They, they don't have everything. They, they, they forget something or, or run out of a little butter or something like that and they need to grab something. And, you know, it's not like it's super busy or anything and whatever. Somehow or another that's, like no longer the case. And I was rather shocked back in like, I don't know, I, I was in Phoenix and, and um, well, I was with my past wife, so, but it was early on. And so it had to be like 2010, 2011, about when I started these videos, maybe a little after. And I was just absolutely shocked. We went to a supermarket and it was closed. It was like, I can't believe that. Like. And it, 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 wasn't even, it wasn't even Christmas, it was like Thanksgiving or something like that. It was just closed, a supermarket. Um, 
I, 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 it would be like a, as if ATMs disappeared and you had to go into the bank again. It was that kind of change to me. Um, similarly, when I lived here the last time, although I was here for the changeover, um, supermarkets were 24 hours, which is what I was used to, right? Everywhere where I've lived where it's been kind of an urban area, supermarkets are 24 hours. The odd ones might not be, like the stupid market of no choice that's near me. Now, none of them are. You know, they all close. And I'm just, I, I'm shocked. Again, it's like, yeah, you know, I know that they probably don't make money by being 24 hours, but it does kind of like, they probably didn't lose much. <laughs> and the convenience aspect made people more familiar with going to that supermarket. I, 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 I don't know. Um, but I was rather shocked because I used to do my shopping at like two in the morning or something. <laughs> Just because it was mellow then. Uh, anyway, here we are, uh, Christmas day. And it's funny because for me, holidays haven't meant anything for one hell of a long time. So it's, it's not like that's a big deal. And it's kind of like, good. Could I go shopping today? It's a little wetter looking than I like, but it's going to be rainier on the next day <laughs> and for most of the week. Uh, so it would have been convenient. But anyway, uh, in, in terms of playing the game, I'm, I'm struggling to get started. But on the bright side, Raid is like, there's good reason for me not to be playing Raid. So. Whatever, I guess I have to move some pieces. But oh boy. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. At the beginning of a new turn, it's like, shouldn't I have just quit? Uh, but we'll keep going. We'll see how bad it is. We know that the capability of the Soviets to advance has been slowed. But it doesn't feel like it's been stopped because these defensive lines can still be, they're still going to have weak spots. It's basically, you're only going to advance where the defender has fucked up for the most part. Nah, you might have, you might have a significant amount of capabilities and whatnot. You might get lucky with the EW and get an advance that way. But for the most part, uh, it's where there's you're not going to be able, it may not be fuck ups, but it's going to be where there's a weakness in the line. So like these are good strong pieces, but there's a potential weakness to that unit against mobile attack. It's very low strength. And that in combination with the EW, if I succeed with the EW and I have a good enough attack, I could get a breakthrough. And that breakthrough, you know, what does it gain me? A couple of hexes, but it also manages to lock out some artillery, and that starts opening up new opportunities um, where I kind of force the NATO line back. Which side am I going to start on? I guess I'm going to start over there with the donut front. Mm, donut front. Uh, rather than uh, over here, simply because this is just, to me, such a nightmare, but I think I have to go to that, you know, and work my way to the middle again as I have been. I'm just babbling to delay having to start. I hadn't completed setting up the reinforcements there, apparently. And this turn, another Czech division comes in. You can see there's four more Soviet divisions that have, uh, that come in later. Now, again, this is all screwed up because of the eight hour versus 12 hour turns. Uh, some of these should be coming in faster. And these guys are coming in with like two movement points, which just doesn't even make sense, right? <laughs> like you come in with one hex under the old rules with two movement points and not everybody makes it on the map. You, know? <laughs> you can only get four units on the map. Well, you're allowed to come in on two roads. So there you go. So yeah, we're gonna be seeing a little cluster, I guess trying to make its way on the map. Uh, who knows if they're gonna get anywhere. Basically, the stuff from the new games is, the, the reinforcements are such late arrivals 
that, like, I'm just not going to get to them. That includes the French and, and well, the Dutch. I don't know. I, I mean, look, there's a lot of turds here. <laughs> you have air superiority as the Soviets. I would be pretty fucking happy with letting a lot of these units just recover. But I don't feel like I can do that because of the air superiority, but I'm having a real hard time coming up with attacks I can make. But I can't just like, so one of the things is, if I don't keep the pressure up, no matter what, NATO's helicopters begin to slowly recover, which is one, one issue to consider. But I'm like looking here and I'm like, wow, this Soviet division is pretty tired. Czech division back here is not in great shape. You know, they're not horrible. They got enough that they could still try to make attacks, but it's like, they're gonna suffer if they make them, right? Overall, the chances are they're going to take the higher level of attrition, which is probably right as the attacker. And they're not likely to gain much. So it's like, well, why bother? Boy, one of the things that confused me was these Czech units. They were below the French. And they look like the same color grouping, right? Purple, blue, whatever. Again, the color scheme that Simonson picked out was really brilliantly done. I, <laughs> other people just don't seem to have the eye for that kind of thing. Like so many games uh, just don't get it. They don't get the, the amount of effort that goes into presenting, you know, a good graphical uh, representation. Example of why I don't want to do a damn thing. Other than that being my nature. So again, these guys, I feel like they're too tired to do much. I could try to pound on this. That doesn't get me anything particularly. Uh, this unit though is, is rested. So it kind of feels like a waste not to use them, but the rest of his division is not. Okay. Let's move to the next division, the four tank. I considered this down here and these guys are really tired and it's like, do you want to wear yourself out more beating up on a German, um, uh, a German battalion in the city? You have the resources in place to make the attack. And if you get away with the EW, you'll succeed. And what do you get? You get this hex, that's it. Can you take that hex at any time? Yeah, probably. I mean, although the chemical weapons are wearing down, but like they're already at the two shift instead of three shift level. All right, but let's go back to this, which I was considering. I'm like, okay, there is a weak spot here where the artillery is behind it. Sure, I have to dive in. I've got a fresh unit here. I could attack. It's a 12 mobile against a two mobile. That gives me six to one. Unfortunately for me, these artillery, which are you know, reasonably fresh are stacked with something. So I'd have to move either the artillery or the something uh, as an unstacking to be able to get them available in order to drop uh, smoke and chemicals with them. So I'll probably use air power for the chemicals and fuck the smoke because this artillery back here is too tired. And then I look back and there's not much. I do have some attack helicopters if I so desire. I might be able to, who's this? I can't even fucking tell. This is RAG. This is actually part of this unit, I think. They're kind of unreadable. One, two, three, four, five. Couldn't get into range that way. I don't know, maybe the other way. Uh, one, two. Mm. Uh, nope. <laughs> yeah, so he's not gonna be able to get into range and be able to play it. I'll bring him up, but that that's the kind of stuff where, that's part of the recovery is bringing units into, uh, up into line that have been you know, left behind. Um, so I'm really looking at a six to one on the mobile. Now, six to one on the mobile is here. I get two shifts for my chemicals, the best I can do. If I do a prepared assault, which will basically mean nothing else, 
I can do as much as three hits on them. Remember, it's down one, but as little as zero. And I might be taking a hit in with that. Is that terrible? I mean, it's an okay trade-off, but I'm not going to get this hex. So is it worth the attack? Well, I don't know. Like, and for me to get that, I have to succeed with the EW. Now, I could up the odds a little bit by throwing some, some helicopters in. So instead of 12 to 2, I could get it up to 18 to 2. And that starts to look like it's more worthwhile. If the EW works, I have a better attack. 18 to 2 gets me to 9 to 1 with two shifts. And that's a much nicer column. I might even be able to do it with a three-point attack, but the problem is then I keep burning my helicopters for each attack, and I can't afford to do that, right? So I think the six-point attack is the way to go. Try to do a little bit of attrition there. He's not going to give way. He's Germans. He's not even allowed to. But if he did, you know, that would be great. But we're not going to get to that. But then that might open up an opportunity for something like this to do a follow-up attack. Will it? No, because I'll be in this hex, and, and there'll be no, no other path through. So I, I can't get much out of this. The most I can get is a little bit of attrition, but I think that's the best I'm going to get throughout the board unless there's something stupidly like set up. My helicopter's here. They're not completely healthy. And, and what does that mean? Well, I mean, they're likely, there's a good chance they take a hit or whatever. So it's like, you really don't want to wear them out because you want them available if you really need them. And this doesn't feel like a, I really need to make this attack. W failed, Germans threw in their helicopter and their additional uh, and artillery that was nearby. And it ended up doing damage to my unit. Okay, big deal. But to the helicopters as well, which is a, which is a big deal because those recover at a one point rate, unlike artillery. And, you know, what did I do? I traded two, or two hits on each of my helicopters for one hit on his, basically. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it would have been fine if the EW didn't fail. I got a 50-50 chance of a good attack. The good attack in this game doesn't tend to be that great. It tends to be a, maybe in this case, it would have been a slight advantage for me attritionally. And instead, it's a slight disadvantage for me attritionally. <laughs> you know? it, basically how, how it trades out. If I had things calculated poorly though, it could have been a lot worse. Of course, that's where the attacker makes their big mistakes. And the kind of mistakes that maybe could be as bad as the defensive mistakes. If you end up making really bad attacks again and again, but it has to be multiple times, really. Then your forces might be a, uh, in, a, in such a position that they can be counterattacked, or at the very least, your forces are so depleted that you no longer can do much with them. And that's good enough because this is really, they're offensive. They're, you know, NATO is not going to get a real counteroffensive. All right. Lots of babbling, not a lot of playing, but I wanted to show you just, you know, how tough it is with something that looks fantastic, right? I got, a, I got six to one odds, I'm able to bring it up to nine to one, right? And not really. <laughs> it, and it ended up at one to one as the base odds with the chemicals thrown in and whatnot. And I wasted resources over there. And I feel like I just have to lower my expectations when it comes down to it. So, you know, I traded off the, I, I moved into position for a full assault over there. Um, I prepared stuff here for a possibility of moving more units into play. And I actually made this attack as sort of a nutritional type attack. The resources that I spend over there, they don't count for shit if I don't use them. So I might as well use them. It seems like an expense, but it's not anymore. It's like, yeah, it's an expense, but I'm not making lots of attacks. So I got away with my EW here, managed to get a fair trade, I guess. I took more hits than the enemy did, but I have more units taking those hits. They can recover more quickly than that one thing. Of course, 
that one thing is really unimportant to the German defense line, but it's just sitting out there and, you know, absorbing losses and I'm uh, just kind of like, sure, whatever. I could have retreated at a hex um, instead of taking a, a second loss, but that would have negated the losses to the Czech helicopter and whatnot, which I don't want to do that. So we stand and fight and hurt. Now we're posing a hard question to the Germans. I'm hitting this with a pretty hefty firepower here. Uh, using normal attack, I've gotten 60 strength points, just a couple of air points in there, some chemicals. Against that five pointer, that gets me up to 12 to one, a couple of shifts, and I'm over here. Oop, give me another shift for a multi-hex combat. And I've counter-batteried their artillery, which is sort of freebie to throw in. You know, yeah, it costs ammo, but so what? Right? <laughs> That's what it's there for. But they have one helicopter they could bring into play against this. It's a seven-point helicopter with three hits on it. Now, should I know the exact hits on it? Probably not. But I, as a player, I know that I've just reduced it by some and, you know, whatever. Most of the units, I'd say, that are engaged and whatnot should know their relative capability, you know, of the enemy of taking damage. Uh, I'm a little bit less convinced with helicopters. But if I throw that in, it brings the defense up to 12 instead of 5. That brings it down to a 5 to 1. Now, we were looking at 1, 2, 3 shifts total. That would bring it to 8 to 1. There's a fair chance that helicopter would die if I hit that. That would be a great result. Better than taking this hex from the Soviet point of view because I've already expanded further up. Now this hex is integral to the German line, but the line could withdraw. So I think I'm gonna just leave it as it is. No EW being spent here, I don't care. Use your helicopter if you want, right? And I think the Germans choose not to. And that's one of the things is that uh, in general, unless somebody fucks up and like doesn't notice a helicopter or something, when you give a person a choice like that, you're giving them a nasty, nasty option is what it comes down to. And taking the helicopter out, and it would be very, very likely, is not, not a good option. Well, we got a major breakthrough here uh, with that attack and then a follow-up attack after it was in the woods, busting the unit, crossed the river here. Am I being too uh, sanguine in my positioning by rushing up there? I don't know. I was able to get another division, uh, another regiment up here. I don't really have much follow-up, but if they try to do something funky other than withdraw, I think I can support this position. I considered bringing this up. This could have gotten as far as here. Would have given me a little bit more solidity. Couldn't make it here. Uh, but, you know, that's a tired unit. Let's let it relax a little bit. Uh, bringing this new division in. What about these helicopters here? You know, they're fine. I can commit them to fight. We, we may think about moving them up, but moving them up doesn't do me much good. It's just a matter of, oh, I don't wanna waste their, their energy, you know? <laughs> their refreshes if I don't use them because I didn't need them in these battles. These were conventional battles. I don't like using my helicopters in conventional. And in both cases, this guy did not want to commit his helicopter. He had too much of a chance of losing it. And you don't want to lose a big fucking seven-point helicopter. <laughs> that thing is just too massive to, to risk. Um, and, but now I'm across, what is this, the Knob River. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, that's this map for now, more or less. And we got these checks coming in. Um, <laughs> very, very slowly. But... Uh, you know, I, I, I will, I, I need a rest after that. It was as hard to accomplish as these maps are when there's a lot of fighting happening on them in a lot of ways, because the fights that I have to do require more thought and more effort in total than, you know, when I was just picking on some armored cav or whatever. 
these are painful to do. But hey, I got two attacks out of one, one stack. That's a pretty, pretty big deal at this point in the game. Um, but a lot of artillery was thrown into that fight. And there's kind of a, well, this guy's out of gas now. <laughs> you know? That's the problem. How bloody foggy it gets here. Um, anyway, time to start working on another map. Hey, we're getting some pretty good gains here. Basically with a single attack against, uh, I don't know, one of these German units. I think it was this one, but I'm not sure. It, because it was normal attack uh, in this rough terrain. We, because the Germans have been abused and their helicopters aren't available to them in range, and the artillery was already counter-batteried, I counter-batteried another artillery, this one up here, and then I punched my way through, and you can see, then I chased the artillery away. But I built out this line here. Am I in supply? I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. This is, this is the danger of it all. So from here, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah I can't do that. Um, one, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, those are Germans. I can't cut through them. Um, I don't think I've got a supply line going through here, but I've also cut off the German supply. And this whole thing is pocketed now. And that means I just need to, you know, maybe shift another division uh, to attack in this direction. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of reserves. I've pumped so much in here, but I'm trying to get up to this uh, airhead and kind of connect things up. This is, uh, well, this is part of 17th Division. Where the fuck did I bring them in? I brought them in way over here, which was probably kind of dumb. <laughs> the first guard tank is what's breaking its way through, but... Uh, but I needed forces over for, for this section, and they were the only division I had available. Um, now, as I work over, I've got the 19th division, which could shift into place and maybe start degrading the American position. The American position is not in good shape. This artillery, for example, is exposed. Uh, actually, it's pinned, so it doesn't really matter. This artillery I'd have to deal with. And I don't think I have anything in range. One, two, three, four, five. Now, uh, wh one of the things with the set piece battles is that the enemy artillery is in range of some of the bigger Soviet artillery pieces. They've got stuff with like 10 hex range. Seven hex is a little bit more common. Four is the most common, whereas most of the NATO stuff is range five. So if it wants to be within range to defend something, it's going to be able to be interdicted with counter battery fire. And that means that, well, you know, as long as I'm fighting along a line, I can take out that artillery. And as long as I'm picking on someone who doesn't have helicopters, I can probably take them out, you know, without having to resort to EW or anything like that. And that's what happened here. Unfortunately, though, now what's the follow-up? How do I get myself into supply? I have to break this, and I don't know how to do that. i got to get a roadway. Um, this is almost connected, but not quite. Could I make it connected? Maybe. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's not going to go anywhere. And this was uh, one, two, three. Three, four, five, and then I don't get any closer. So I, I've got to get a little bit more ground, and I'm going to be out of supply, but that may mean that I just need to use another impulse uh, to fight to try, to try to deal with this. Or else, hey, maybe they'll try to escape. But it doesn't look like they have an easy escape, to tell you the truth. So I feel like we're in this kind of co-type position where we're, we're, both, uh, we're both threatened and neither of us can really do anything about it. Hard for me to read the pieces from a distance. These aren't one guard tank. 
These are 18 or 16 guard tank. Um, and I guess this is part of it. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, I was looking at this and I'm like, whoa, that's not the same. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to have a tough time getting a supply line through here. So this guy goes one, two, three, four, and he's in supply. He can trace down here. You can see how tenuous the road is. But <laughs> then from there, everything's clean. But I think everything beyond that is out of supply at this point. But we're tightening the noose. I guess we're making slow but steady progress. Uh, we reduced this city. I don't think I talked about that on camera, but I may have. Uh, and then, no, I don't, didn't. I just did that and advanced forward. And then we destroyed a unit in this hex, a nice moderate size US unit using EW. Um, sort of a mixed strategy here. I suppressed all the artillery with counter battery fire, but still used EW because there's a couple of helicopters, but the chance of the US using them is low. However, I just wanted to make sure. And with multiple attacks, fair amount of resources expended, but I think the gains are well worth it. Now we've gained this, this roadway here, and that's kind of important. It's probably not enough for this. Four, eight, no, <laughs> obviously not. But if I move into, say, this hex, actually, this, yeah, this has its own. If I move into this hex with this unit, then I'm at still, still six. Basically, I need to clear the road here uh, to get supplies up to this guy. But, you know, we're kind of working our way towards it. And as we bust over the river here, it makes holding the river here less and less valuable. Because at any time, Soviet forces could roll up that flank if they so desired. Now, obviously, look, you know, it's going to be secured or whatever. But it means that the river line is no longer the important defensive structure that it is currently. And, you know, squeezing things like this, hey, maybe we want to get out of there. <laughs> like, it's beginning to look pretty damn iffy being in that position. Especially since I, I, I don't know what I'm trying to hold, although, you know, attacks here to reduce and, and uh, the capability, well, to reduce that unit so that we can keep pushing forward, you know, are, are painful. But we're also trying to save this unit. And, and, and there's this sort of intermingling that's just really, really complex and painful uh, to look at. Um, I think we are easily, yeah, about 15 minutes past, I spent about a half hour doing two attacks there, okay? Um, and I'm getting better, basically. You know, fi finding those attacks. And that doesn't mean that I'm not doing anything further back uh, to the south there. It just means I don't know yet, right? Uh, e each, each iteration in this game is starting to take longer and longer for doing less and less. But I'm still advancing. And that, that is key. You know, as long as the Soviets can keep their attack moving, once it stalls, it stalls. And it's really a question of, once I recognize that, I think I just call it. Because again, the game does not support NATO being able to do broad counterattacks. In this, well, in the eventual uh, design, I'm sure it would have allowed somewhat larger uh, counterattacks than you know, we maybe might see in this, but for the most part, the goal for, for, for the NATO side is to hold as much of this ground as they can. And the idea of trying to attack to retake ground, unless there's a real opportunity, and there might be with something like this, it might be worth taking that guy out with the surprise rolls and whatnot. 
or at least reducing his capabilities. But the cost in terms of units to do that is just exorbitant. I mean, this guy still has a 12 defense or a not, uh, yeah, 12 defense, mobile or not. Um, yeah, good luck getting those six to one odds against that, right? That's not something you're just gonna pull out of your ass. You gotta completely set it up. And I, there just aren't enough NATO troops to do that. Now, in the eventual game, maybe even maybe localized counterattacks would be easier, but as they stand, it's really tough to find anything. Now, remember, with the surprise attack rules, you get doubled, but still, I mean, we're looking at, you know, stacks of two units each, maybe eight strength points in a stack um, against a 12 defense, eight strength points in a stack, doubled to 16 per. Um, you know, if I'm, I'm looking to say five to one even, which would be 60, uh, we count 32, 48, 64, what is that? That's like, uh, now I'm trying to think, five times 16, five, 50, 60, 70, 80, four times 16. Yeah, so four, four stacks, four, Big stacks, like heavy, heavy units. The heaviest stuff that I have has like a four attack. If we go to the British, they have some heavier attack units. Uh, but I don't think the US does. I think fours are, are the biggest the US does, and the Germans have those as well. And then in conjunction with that, sure, you can throw some artillery and whatnot in. You're not gonna get the gas advantage. NATO's not allowed to use gas. There's no air power right now in my favor. There might be at some point. But yeah, it just, it seems almost impossible to launch anything like a counterattack, even on a very localized level. Like just this, hey look, this one guy snuck through, let's hurt him. <sighs> Good fucking luck, man. <laughs> Good fucking luck. Um, if he's really behind enemy lines, you might be able to maul him like, you know, wherever I, uh, yeah, back here where I landed my, uh, my paratroopers, but then again, they don't get surprise. So, whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah. All righty. Anyway, it's time to go raid for a while. And again, it's getting dark enough. You can see over here, uh, I've got to have these little spotlights on, on the map to be able to play. It's kind of been that way all day that I'm really unlikely uh, to be doing much more, but I don't know. It requires so much focus on an area that the spotlight isn't that bad, honestly. Happy Boxing Day and all that. It seems like every day at <laughs> this time of year has its own little name. I mean, if you count the Catholic Saints days, but oh yeah, then everything does, but uh, or nearly everything, like half the days have something special. And if you count product, uh, yeah, things like National Oatmeal Day, <laughs> Okay, uh, I guess we're gonna try to crack in some more. It looks to me like I've got my tweezers here. What the fuck? That's a weird place for me to have them. As if I've given up on the Hoff Gap now. Now, obviously, a lot of units haven't moved, but I think that may be the case because I remember kind of pushing over here. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know where the fuck I am. I mean, obviously, I did a lot of stuff over here. Uh, I've got Raid playing by itself for a while, but I, I, I have to be playing a lot right now. Um, it looks like I did quite a bit over here. Made some key attacks, but I don't feel like I, uh, I handled all the follow-ups. But I think I wanted to look into what's going on here. I think that's that's what I'm saying is that, yeah, I'm not done, but all right. It's hard when you walk away for a while. Sure wasn't done on the Hoff Gap map. Um, <laughs> we got a kill pile now. In order to try to save this unit, get it back in supply, not really save it, but get it back in supply, I pushed the 20th check unit in, and you can see it's punched, uh, 
you know, initially I was like, oh, I can position some artillery, start bringing some reserves up. But what I was able to find was some weak units, basically artillery that I could pick off in the back lines. And we managed to just break this open by pushing through this road here. This guy still isn't in supply yet. I'm working on another side of things. I just uh, counterbatteried this. And now there may be another one that I have to do. There's this guy that I may have to counter battery as well. But I'm just like, you know, trying to pick off the artillery. The helicopters are not willing to commit on, like, unless they can make it really good odds for the most part. But I might be willing to throw this guy in. Things are beginning to look really, really nasty down there. Like, the river's been crossed, and I think my position on this map has, I, I, it may have already, I, I, actually, it's already fallen, right? <laughs> this is too big an incursion. I can't do shit about this. These little ones, when it was small, I, I could maybe contain it. But at this point, um, I think NATO is looking at, yeah, we've, we've lost this map. And that's bad. Uh, that's very bad. Um, among other things, you know, look, we can hold a line around Nuremberg and maybe try to cut up or, you know, try to solidify something going, um, I guess, northwest from Nuremberg. But the river line was the big defensive terrain. The thing with rivers, though, is they're weird, right? Once you get your crossing over a river and you start uh, gaining some ground on it, the terrain doesn't tend to be all that impressive. Now over here, this is just nasty terrain near the rivers, right? Lots of lots of hills and whatnot, or, or cliffs even probably. Um, I haven't seen that part of Germany, but I, I can imagine I've seen you know things in Belgium and stuff that look like that, and obviously like Fredericksburg, <laughs> where there's like nastiness right near the river, and yeah, you're you're able to continue fighting in, in rough terrain. But uh, this stuff, the woods and the, and, and what is it, the broken, it's just not, not that big a, a restriction. Once you get into the rough terrain, the brown stuff, um, you're talking about shit that you really would rather not be fighting in. And whether there's river or not, you just really rather would not be fighting in it. Ah, uh, all right. I gotta check on raid, but uh, yeah, this is this is impressive. And again, I think it's gonna be more or less over relatively soon in terms of and and at this point, you know, I, I keep saying ah, I think NATO is gonna be able to stop them like they can in NATO, and like on a single map game of this, I swear you're able to pretty much do, but once you can start utilizing movement from one map to the other, that's just such an advantage for the attacker in finding holes. And also, the defender has a much, much broader scope to pay attention to. It would be kind of fun to play this uh, as a big multiplayer. Um, you know, divide the map into s sectors. I, you kind of think five per side is the optimal because of the number of maps, but honestly, I, I think three per side is about the biggest that a game feels comfortable with. Once you start going above that, I don't know, just uh, feels like it's too hard to, to keep control of everything and understand what the fuck's going on at all. But yeah, in that case, you'd have an additional issue, which would affect both sides, which is the competence of the individual players could well impact and, you know, a, a lousy player on one map could basically lose the whole war, right? <laughs> because something like this happens when it shouldn't. Now, maybe this shouldn't have happened either. Maybe I'm a lousy defender, but who knows? I certainly cheated for the Soviets in the, first, in the second turn of the game and probably cheated on both sides in various other times. And I managed to separate Units, I have the 18th guard here and the 15th guard. They were right near each other. I pulled the 15th guard back around the back way and out here, and now it's extended itself here. Um, the helicopter was used to defend this, 
uh, was, I mean, vaguely successful. I use a point for the helicopter. I could have lost the helicopter very easily there. But it's a smaller one. I felt like it was safer to do. Well, I got a big one back here. What the fuck? Jesus, I wasn't even seeing that. God damn it. It's so hard to keep track of, you know, those things really ought to stand out more. I, I can't keep track of them. Um, so, like, all of this would have been reliant on electronic warfare if I had known, because that sucker, he probably, would have, he probably would be badly beaten, but this incursion would not have happened. <laughs> you know? Um, it was the fact that my two helicopters were in such bad shape that prevented me. But it's just, it's so fucking hard to keep track of, uh, you know, what resources you have. It's not, you know, some games, and I, I'm thinking here the OCS type games, the air units are so separated from everything else. They look, they're usually not on the map even. They're usually like in holding boxes and whatnot, if I recall correctly. Um, but there, there are specific airfields they have to be in and everything. And the equivalent to that in this game is the capability of the helicopters to do stuff. So, you know, I mean, I'm just fucking up left and right. Some of it's because I'm walking away from the game and I'm not as focused on it. Um, part of which has to do with the lighting, part of which has to do with the raid, part of which has to do with, like, I mean, not being able to play something like this for very long at a time. <laughs> um, but I'm kind of in the mood now, and then I see something like this, and I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I just screwed everything up. You know? <laughs> oh, bad commander. Oh, no, he couldn't. He's tied down. Excellent, excellent. Okay. No problem there. I feel much better now. I feel much better. I feel like I made some iffy decisions by not committing that smaller helicopter earlier. But I don't think that would have made much difference. But a big five-pointer not being in play would easily make the difference. But you can see how easy it is. Like, I see the helicopter and I'm like, oh, why can't it? You know, I, it's just like, it's fucking, you've got to be aware of so much of this board and what's going on on it and how, how to interdict and whatnot. God damn me. By the way, um, while I was playing Raid, I started watching something on apparently um, what were basically allied claims. So uh, allies made lots of claims of atrocities against the Germans in World War I. We're all aware of, you know, the eating babies and shit like that, you know, <laughs> and, and, and the rape of Belgium type of stuff. But uh, apparently there were relatively believed rumors of factories that basically rendered corpses, German soldier corpses for the most part, into useful goods, notably soap. <laughs> and I'm wondering how much, you know, how much impact, because the German soldiers even believed it, okay? Uh, how much impact these rumors had on sort of creating a willingness for later on in World War II for just such kinds of atrocities to be happening. Just a, an aside that came from nowhere. All right, I know I've got the 17th division to move. That I think I'm gonna commit up into here because I've been so successful here. I don't wanna blunder, I don't wanna bludgeon more stuff here, although if NATO does withdraw, it could be very valuable. I think it's better to use you know, more indirect methods, although this is not weak uh, still, but to pursue up into that area and try to fight there. And with the movement of the 17th up into this general region, making contact over here, to some extent I'm trying to prevent the NATO forces from, fall, from running away. Right, that's part of the contact. So that's like what the Czech uh, East German Fourth Division is kind of doing. I don't. It's it's hard to come up with anything I can do of value with these units. Maybe I'd like to keep them mobile in case the NATO forces do pull away, in order to be able to react. That might not be a bad choice. Same thing with the, uh, you know, undamaged. 
or un untired units on the front. I don't like to do it, but there's no real reason not to, especially since I'm not expecting NATO to, to counterattack against some of these units. So keeping, keeping a mobile force, a reserve that's in contact with the enemy, might actually be of some value by doing that. Uh, on the other hand, if I don't want to wear them out, <laughs> um, you know, if I know I don't want to wear them out no matter what, there's absolutely no reason to do that because, yeah. Um, but if something like this withdraws, will I want to advance? Probably not. Probably not. But there might be some opportunity that's just too valuable to pass up. And then I looked over here and I'm like, well, 7th Guard, uh, they're kind of out of units. Um, they're, they're relatively fatigued. They did some attacks over here before I went back over to this map. And I think I'll just end up uh, leaving them in place. I fixed most of my supply issues. This guy still looks like he's got problems. Actually, this whole incursion over here may have problems, but I've got this road now, which is a big deal. So one, two, three. So these guys are in good. One, two, three, four. This guy's fine. Yeah. I've, I've solved all the supply issues. Actually, I wouldn't have moved this guy up here if, if he hadn't been in supply. <coughs> I've uh, solved all the supply issues. This thing's still probably got... No, he can cross right there and get to the road. And I control the network behind that. So, yeah. Yeah, it looks like I've solved all the problems over on the Hofgap map. And that's pretty cool. At least for the Soviets. It's not so good for NATO. Um, <coughs> Jesus. I'm kind of hungry. And uh, I'm thinking this is not a bad place to stop. Because this, this tweezer is at the right place. I'm now moving my way over. And I might actually end up switching to that other map. Although, I don't know. The, the problem is, I mean, I get up and it's like 2 p.m., you know, at least today. Uh, some days I'm up during the morning. Some days I'm, uh, I'm just not available during the morning, whatever. And it's just like there's such a small slice of time when I can actually play this when the lighting is at all decent, which is the problem, of course, of playing down here, unless I bring more lights. But the, the real thing is these little guys, these make great spotlights, but I need a, an ambient light, and there's just nothing over here. You could say, well, you could use that thing. And the lights there are really crappy. Um, maybe it's the bulbs that I use, but it, that is not a, a sufficient place uh, for it. Uh, yeah, I'm just delaying the decision here. Um, I actually have a lot of resources left in terms of air power. Uh, I think I'm over 30. I'm usually... Right? Yeah, I'm at like 35. I've, I've used less than half my resources, and I feel like I've done quite a bit. Sure, I'm not all the way through the map yet, I've got other fights to, to conduct, but I feel in better shape than I usually am. Usually I've burned too many resources when I get here. But by doing less battles, which is kind of the nature of, of how it's going now, um, as opposed to before where I had battles all over the place, and every single one, I wanted to throw an air point in because it delivers a chemical, right? And uh, last turn I started learning, hey, you know, okay, Let's waste uh, a three-point artillery to deliver the chemicals. Uh, plus, also, if I want smoke, I can't do that by air. So that's uh, a big deal. I still got this shit to clear up. And I'm too tired. You know, I mean, there's just no reason to. But it's got a whole division tied down by a couple of companies of fucking armored cav down there. Yeah, they're just East Germans. Um, This doesn't look very strong to me. They're sitting in, in decent terrain so far as they can find it in that plane. But yeah, that, that looks... Uh, on the other hand, there aren't, a lot of, there aren't a lot of Soviet troops there either. <laughs> the focus is just pressed into the, hey, let's take advantage of the maps. <laughs> 
Which is why I say, I think this is the key map. Like, if you're gonna judge victory, look, if you win most of the bearer map, you're still at the same level of westward uh, expansion as you'd be on the fifth core map. But if you can leverage wins on, say, Hofgap or Bayor to get you deeper into fifth core, and that's quite possible, I think that makes sense. So I kind of feel like the furthest west that I get is really the, the delimiter. So, you know, this attack doesn't mean a hell of a lot, right? When you compare it to, I'm up here, you know? I'm beyond the level of all the other maps on the fifth core map. And so to me, that's kind of the, the center of victory. I, I don't have anything better than that uh, to judge. Okay, I'm just wasting time basically to make certain that I don't start playing on this next, uh, on this next map, which I, I honestly kind of want to do. I pushed a little bit more. I actually used this 11th division. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have, uh, to beat up those couple armored calf. Now, helicopters could have committed themselves. I'm like, go ahead, buddy. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, you know, they might have been able to stop these Germans because they weren't all that strong. Uh, they looked strong, but, you know, I didn't have a whole shitload of, like, artillery firepower or whatever in place. But, you know, it's like... It's really not worth it. I don't know what's here. But yeah, This is too valuable to defending all this to worry about that. Uh, but I had a couple of undamaged units of the 11th, one of which is now... No, that's not it. This one under here was undamaged. Uh, but another one that was loose that I managed to pull up to there, which is kind of... I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with the 11th, but it looks like I need more troops up there. And <laughs> it'll help secure, you know, any any kind of uh, any kind of hold up here. But it's hard to see the big big picture picture when I have uh, when I have these little spotlights on things. So I. I'm not getting much light from out there, so I guess I'll, I'll just play rain. But I, I really wanted to play this. I really want to play this right now. I don't know why. Um, and that's why I was drawn to it. Here it is, what, Wednesday, I think? I don't know. I can't keep track of time anymore. Um, and we're back to the game. I really want to play. But as usual, you know, I start studying the board, and I'm like, oh, fuck, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to figure out, you know, I, I'm moving to this board. I could work on this one, but I feel like I want to um, I want to start working inward from the right a little bit more. But it's really, really, and it's not like there's any reinforcements coming from the barrel map. Well, there's some here that I could bring in, other than this column. So, you know, it's not like I have a choice of what I want to shift which way and where, whereas here I have a lot of forces that I can deploy as needed. So I kind of want to understand um, both directions better. But I don't want to start at the extreme right. This is sort of the least important stuff in the game. I want to look at the important place, which is honestly right here at the point uh, where I'm piercing. And it, it, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to try to understand what the hell um, I want to do. Uh, and I could air mobilize still in order to deal with uh, some of these stupid head, uh, uh, helicopters. This one's no problem. That one's a problem. And that's British. And then there's a big German one that's a problem. And then we come over here and this one's British. There's another one there, I think. A tiny one. That's... See, these little guys, they can be a problem. They can be a serious problem. Hmm. All right, I guess I'll look up those rules because I need to do that before. Well, no, I need to do paradrops before I do anything else. I'm not sure about uh, airborne. But 
I would very much, and there was some reason why this didn't make sense before, and I don't remember what it was. <laughs> like I looked it up and said, oh, I can't do it. But I don't remember why. Something that I completely forgot about, and just ran into a rule on, <laughs> getting distracted away from my original question, which is really, why am I not using air mobile units? Honestly, <laughs> I'm not sure what the answer to that is, except that there are now contiguous lines of NATO um, forces, which means that there are zones of control in most areas where I can't just helicopter units in safely. If I get a breakthrough, I can. But as things stand right now, this... I could helicopter stuff from this side across the Elba, though. There's nothing in the way there. So that's, that's something to consider. Remember, I have like 30 hexes of movement, so I have a lot of uh, capability. Oh. And I also have poles coming in this turn, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I think. Um, but what, what, oh yeah. Company-sized units, exert a zone of control, but you can leave it for just six uh, operations points as if there was a covering force in play. Uh, you don't have to roll a die. I don't know how much effect that would have, but for example, down here, I didn't have to eliminate these. I could have just said screw it and moved away from it. I think with like three armored cav back there, they could have done a lot of shit to my supply. So that's not too big a deal. Also that unit I bypassed, it kind of gives me some hand wavy arguments of why I could bypass it. Although I think that might've been a self propelled artillery that didn't even have a zone. But I actually walked through it. So, I mean, that would have been illegal. <coughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why, like I can break down a motorized, uh, no, no, what the fuck? <sighs> It's like, so here, I don't, I have to go look up the Bayor rules, which are probably the same goddamn things. Um, all East German, Czech, and Soviet motorized rifle regiments, all Soviet airborne mechanized. Oh yeah, so I'd have to find a motorized unit. There aren't a lot of those on the board. I thought it was mechanized, um, yeah, but a motorized unit, there are not going to be many of those. And now in the Bayor map, what do we got? And we got no, no answer for these guys. That hasn't, you know, been created yet. It probably exists in the current rule set, but I'm not going to. Um, and here, Soviet 3-4 and 2-3 airborne mechanized divisions or battalions. Soviet 1014, 812, and 68 mechanized regiments. What the hell? Why am I able to break down full mechanized units in one map? And th this was done, you know, in the SPI days. And here, all East German, Czech, and Soviet motorized rifle regiments, also Soviet me mechanized battalions. I don't fucking know. There should be a, a symbol on the unit. Not that I could read that, to tell you the truth. But yeah, um, it may just be us. And, and trying to, to connect it to what it would mean over here, if we followed this. Now I gotta find it again. Soviet 1014, 812, and 6-8 mechanized regiments. See, my, my problem is why are those units over on the Bayor map allowed to break down and not allowed to on the Fifth Corps map? I want a more general rule. Um, and this was actually, this conversion I think was done by Kampf. Yeah, 
Yeah, our camps. Um, geez. I, I want to follow just one rule or the other. And if I can use mechanized uh, units, that's a big deal, <laughs> you know? Um, because I got a lot of them. All right. I, I probably will go with a more generalized rule using allowing mechanized units to break down because trying to remember whether or not motorized units, you know, whether or not I am only allowed to break down motorized units on these maps, I'm not going to be able to do that. Plus, I don't even fucking know where motorized units are. Like, I've seen almost none of them. And maybe I'll allow them to break, you know, if I run across them, I'll allow them to break down wherever I see them. There probably are none on the bear map, and that's the whole issue. But the rest of the rules on, on the air mobiles and airmobile. Uh, it's like Playmobil. I've made that joke before in Vietnam, but I, it, it always, it, it's not really a joke. It's just something that connects in my head. Um, it does use friction points on the helicopter even though they're different helicopters. I know I brought that up before. And the idea of breaking down a unit into really just garbage and taking the hit on the helicopter is a painful call. Certainly, I, I don't want to fly the helicopter through zones of control while they take air defense fire. But I, I don't know. Like, being able to neutralize some of these helicopters would be really, really useful. On the other hand, I have to follow the helicopter distance thing, and I have to go to the pickup hex and then to the destination. I don't think I'll have enough to be able to get me all the way out there. I might be able to knock this one out, which is of interest. From here, I'd have to fly through. Like this guy could convert and maybe knock that out and then those guys are in danger. And I feel like I'm just, I've got so many balls in the air to try to make any decision of, what's one thing, one thing I can fucking do? I feel like a Republican congressman there, or the Republican Congress in, as a whole. What's one thing I can do, um, you know, to be able to, to, to hit this? Ah, how much EW do I have? Because that's the other option. I can just fucking say, screw it. I have eight, which is a decent amount, but not enough to make a whole hell of a lot of attacks. Like, remember, one EW lets you make one attack, but I may want to make multiple attacks off one unit's operations. If I'm paying three points per ops, I quite often am doing three attacks, two, two to three attacks with that unit, at least in the earlier phase of the game. In the later phase, it might just mean one, one multi-hex attack or something to give me the best options. But I don't look like I'm set up for a lot of multi-hex attacks either. I thought I was doing that, but it doesn't seem to have happened. I guess there's one here. That doesn't look too bad. <laughs> we had success. So, a couple of EW points. The artillery fire from here, mainly to provide smoke and chemicals, although I did... Uh, throw in an extra point as well to get me for the, for the secondary attack. The primary attack was this unit and the unit here hit into here. And they badly reduced the British uh, mechanized unit to within one hit. Both times the EW succeeded. So here I am pinning this artillery, which is a very valuable move. Not enough. <laughs> but it does actually open things up if I have a helicopter within range that has, like, capabilities to maybe throw some shit um, to take out a British unit. I could take out this British helicopter. I don't think I can reach these, though. And that's the problem. <laughs> Clearing the, the, because the air mobile operations as opposed to the airborne operations don't happen during normal movement. They don't happen, have to happen at the beginning of your, your ops. Um, I have a freedom to clear a path for the helicopters to travel on. I am recording, good. <laughs> One problem though, is that 6th Guard is mainly here 
but some of it's up here. Basically, I've got the unit split, and I've got this 20th guard tank that I intend to exploit the attack here. These guys aren't going to do much. They're just holding the position. They kind of, I kind of set it up so that I could go in either direction. And this direction looks the more appealing for the, for the most part, mainly because it's further north. It gets me, you know, some capability to push through there. So let's see what I can do with the 20th guard tank. It's not going to be a hell of a lot because this is all swamp here. And swamp is fucking nasty. Seven movement points to go through swamp. And nothing reduces that. I can't like bridge it or anything like that. So this causeway, this road, is really the only way up. And there's a big nasty Brit sitting here in the marsh, which is not a particularly good uh, good terrain type either. It's like the dark brown, the rough. It's hard to fight, it, it's hard to attack in the marsh. <sighs> Makes sense, but it's also hard to defend in the marsh, too, because you can't dig in or anything uh, to the same effectiveness. But I would... See, a breakthrough here would be really, really valuable. But I don't quite have it, I think. But I might be able to kind of force it? I don't know. The very fact of these helicopters makes my attacks of the type that I was able to succeed so well in over on this map, difficult. Um, what worked well there was a lot of counter battery fire. I could launch a ton of counter battery fire and knock out you know this very easily, but I don't have an answer for the helicopter or helicopters, and that's that's where the airborne and air mobile operations really come to their fore. But I'm looking around and I, I just don't think I have a helicopter that can do it. Let me see if this guy can. Because if I can get... Yeah. See, I can't knock these fuckers out, though. This guy and this guy, uh, that's not one. This guy might be able to reach. This guy certainly can still reach all the way down to here. And if we're talking about breakthroughs over here... Then we got a couple up here that can reach. <sighs> can I open up a gap on the Bayor map that'll allow me to do something? Maybe, maybe, maybe I switch my focus. Maybe I start thinking differently, you know, not this, eh, let's, let's work left to right and then right to left towards the center. Maybe we have to work the whole board at once to have any shot. Basically, each turn becomes this massive convoluted puzzle as to, you know, first of all, there's an optimization problem. How do I best? But there's a simple, there's simple little puzzles within it. How do I possibly take this hex? Probably very, very appealing to the kind of people who loved like the squad leader puzzles, but on a bigger scale, so intertwined and so messy. So oh, let's look for candidates on the Bayor map where we can maybe get a breakthrough and see if we can get our helicopters through there. So one candidate is right here. Yeah, this is not the greatest path in the world, but these artillery at least don't bother me. And I can also push through and hit the artillery. So maybe I can do stuff there. Of course, I don't have helicopters too far forward, right? Because, in general, they're able to support the line from a, a, a fair distance. So, you know, I tend to bring them on the map where they're safe. I've been pushing them, you can see, further in some places. Uh, but on the bear map, <coughs> I haven't been getting any. I got a new one here. That might help. Um, and it's kind of funny how in the, in the, in the new game, in the new game systems, they're allowed to transport their own goods, their own bases. Um, so that's one possibility. I don't see much likelihood of breaking through any of this. Certainly over here looks really, really tough, just because I don't have my troops in place for it. And that's kind of the issue here, along with the bad terrain and the depth, maybe, of defenses, is 
I'm not engaging there. I'm engaging here, but there's a tremendous depth of NATO forces in this little triangle here that I'm not going to be able to penetrate. I don't think I'm going to be able to get it through here. Again, my troops are far away. They'd have to, you know, get a really lucky success or something. Um, things are kind of weak through here, but remember I had supply issues. So I think it all comes down to really this one hex. Can I launch an attack on that hex? Um, this one won't do because there's zones here and here. This is the only opening, the only easy opening that I see. I doubt I can do it. I'm going to think about it a little bit. But, uh, you know, I've only got two units in place here. It would have to be a mobile attack. It's in nasty terrain. It just doesn't look like I'm set up to be able to pop my way through there. And of course, if the unit retreats, that doesn't really help me. It'll still maintain its zones. However, maybe I can fly around behind helicopters and stuff, or behind artillery and stuff there. Yeah. If I succeed, from where my helicopters are right now, I can trace to about here. Now, what if I brought this sucker in? He could get to about here. He might be able to do it. Let me check that. Because if I can't possibly do it with a helicopter on this impulse, then I give up this whole strategy, right? And I go back to, okay, let's try to bludgeon our way with EW. There's another option, which is attrition. Um, I can make attacks in places where it's less vital to my strategy, less likely to succeed, et cetera, and hope that the uh, defender uses their helicopters up to the point where they're unwilling to use them anymore. I think there's too many British helicopters for that to really succeed, though. Running off the path, it doesn't work. <laughs> I can get to about here. I could get this helicopter. I can't get any of the ones back here, and this one was in range, definitely to interfere, but of course it's only a one-pointer, so maybe it wouldn't be that big a deal. Uh, um, another option is I could take the air defense fire. That's a friction point on the helicopter, which really sucks, and on the unit that I'm transporting, which, okay, those units are basically sacrificial. Like, I'd basically turn a regiment into three little, three little pieces of shit that can, uh, you know, each neutralize a helicopter for a little while. Oh, it's getting, it's getting complicated, isn't it? Oh, I think, uh, like with the naval rules, I just want to put this aside and out of my mind again. I, I just, I feel like it's too complex. The problem is getting too complex for me to actually cope with. And for some reason, it's getting dark. Probably why I didn't go shopping today. I haven't even fucking put my wheels on yet. And that, that was supposed to be my task either yesterday or today. Uh, fucking hell. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Um, and meanwhile, Raid's playing in the background. And I have to take a dump. Which, between all these things, I'm not too happy right now. Funny, the whole, uh, you know, bopping back and forth to do to set up raid so that it plays by itself, coming over here trying to do this. And then other life concerns, not just the toilet, but, you know, just the whole weight of all these concerns. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that drives me fucking crazy. I just want to concentrate on one thing at a time, and it's really hard to do, because this is the thing I want to concentrate on, but Raid especially is very demanding, but I mean, you know, I, I have to get food and stuff too, right? I've been very restrictive with uh, stacking and movement, which is that units have to begin stacked together to move as a stack. The rules, from what I can tell, are actually ambiguous on this. There's nothing that says you can that a stack can pick up units, 
But there's nothing that says that it can't. <laughs> this is very odd for an SPI game, at least that I could find. I'm trying to reason out because this is an important issue. So I brought this chain in and I could have set it up differently so it was more capable of attacking. But the question that is sitting here is, can I move an artillery, pick up a, a regular unit, maybe pick up one of those small four floor tanks and launch an attack with that combination? I don't see a reason why I wouldn't be able to coordinate in that way. So I'm gonna allow it, uh, but I haven't so far. So we're seeing you know, kind of a difference in how I'm playing. Um, that's gonna give the Soviets a little bit more punch than they've had previously. That wouldn't help in the first impulse of the game, uh, the first pulse that the Soviets enter the board, because they have to enter in order based on this sucker. And each unit is moved one at a time coming on the map. You have no opportunity to do that. However, there are other things in the game that make that first turn entry onto the board uh, less effective for, for the Soviets as well. For example, they can't deploy their artillery up in front of their regular units to perform any kind of suppression, uh, well, to, to support the attacks. So their attacks basically are completely unsupported by artillery in that first impulse of the game, except where their units are already deployed on the map, which is, you know, in a couple of cases, I think that's only on the new maps. So, which probably didn't have the doctrinal issues in play. So what we saw was more effective combat capability happening, or available at least, here and there. I think over on the Donau front, I had already started to develop an understanding of how to use artillery properly in that first impulse of the game. But I think I started over here and did not have uh, that, that view. But it doesn't help at all on the first three games that were published because everything enters the board on those. <laughs> and troops aren't deployed for, for fighting. They're, they're in like this march mode, essentially, with I think the idea being that they can just brush, that they'll brush past the um, uh, armored cav. I don't know what to say about any of that. <laughs> like, uh, there's something very weird about the way the doctrine rules uh, force things. I think I'm going to have to swap batteries. And I'm, st you know, I I've spent like, Jesus, almost two hours awake now, I think. And yeah, I've been doing some raid. Call it an hour and a half since I started playing this with distractions and whatnot. I have moved literally one piece in that time. <laughs> Well, no, I've moved this division, uh, its forces to set up, you know, for what's going on. <laughs> this is painful to me because, you know, I want to I want to finish this game. I want to play it. I want to enjoy it. I want to finish it and I want to get to other games <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, too much talk, I'm sure, but also too much thinking. It's, it's the thought and the panic of all this other shit that's really kind of handcuffing me here. A couple attacks on this unit to try to push it out of my way. And EW failed on both of them. Helicopters were brought in in both cases. I ended up taking hits. I brought my own helicopter into play for both those attacks. And that took a hit. It was a failed um, move in that direction. But I still got this, uh, I could try to pick on this thing. I'm, I'm just trying to, to bust my way through. Sure, it's in the swamp as well. But I think we can, can uh, you know, gain more advance with this, what is it? 37th guard tank. Since it's already committed to going up this way, I'm gonna keep pumping it up in, in, into that direction. This may actually be more effective. I would love to have cleared the road, but if I can kind of, uh, you know, outflank that British position, 
that might be better than anything I can do. And then I can always move something like six guard tank to tie down um, these British units and prevent them from retreating easily. They'd have to make a die roll or whatever to get out of the hex. So that, that's kind of effective, pinning something in place after you've accomplished your outflank. It's also kind of unrealistic because the truth of the matter is these units would be moving at the same time into contact to pin as other units are trying to achieve the breakthrough. It's just, there's, there's no way of really achieving um, a realistic decision cycle in a board game. Uh, because everything, I mean, I guess you could pulse movement everywhere and all kind of shit like that. But also, I feel like something like an RTS does a much better job of trying to capture that kind of cycle where, you know, you send orders to something, you get distracted with something else, and the units that you've sent orders to continue with their orders, even if they're no longer applicable. It works really well. The problem with that for me, though, is I don't have the whole picture, so I can't really see the story as it's unfolding. It's more realistic um, from the command point of view, but my understanding of what actually happened is lower. Now, maybe if you then did some sort of, hey, let me see what happened here and play it back and everything, you could get that picture better. Of course, I'd rather play things in my mind than watch them on a screen or, you know. It's why movies are no good for me. I can make better movies for myself or ones that I enjoy more is, is I think, the more important thing. Well, that attempt failed as well. I was hoping for a retreat because with a retreat, I would be able to bring more units into play. But now I'm kind of clogged here. And I mean, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. I could launch yet another attack up here. I could actually get this guy surrounded, which would give me another column shift. That, that might be my, my best move at this point. I got away with the EW, but I went with a prepared attack. And after moving, that means there ain't nothing left. I've expended just about everything I have on the North German Plains map in terms of EW, etc., to basically not accomplish much. I crossed the river line. I think it means yeah, this is going to be tough because um, defending this river line was one thing, but now I'm going to have to figure something to defend across here after a pullback, and that's going to stretch forces over here even worse. So across the board, I think this was a good move. It could have been a lot better though. <laughs> it could have been a hell of a lot better, but it does make, uh, you know, maybe the Dutch or whatever have to do something else. And it may change the focus, say where I said, see the poles have to come in towards the north though. That's the problem with them. Um, I think they have to come in. They have to come in from here to here, I think. And that's. They may be even allowed to come in back here, but that's a long walk to get you know across this river. So probably don't want to use them for that. I'm committing so much of the Bayor map in this direction that it's weakening you know, whatever I could do against Hanover here. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's time to look at Raid and see what's up with that. Uh, but now I've moved two divisions today. <laughs> uh, this is going to take fucking forever with the amount of thought. Now, obviously, there are a lot of places where there just isn't much that I can do. Like, this was the big think in terms of like the big attack on this map. So I can probably finish off the map today at least, I hope. <sighs> the rest of my effort so far, <laughs> all of the rest of my effort so far, but most of the rest of what I have available on this map, instead of concentrating on trying to reduce this, which would have been another option, I'm actually reducing Hamburg. And you can see counter battery fire, uh, pushing up against these units, but mainly I've been successful in this area uh, in 
sort of collect, uh, destroying the units that were getting in my way here. And I pushed somebody across the river here. I'm down to one EW point, two, two, no, none, none. I used my last EW point um, to bust through over here. I don't know what it all means, but a number of places I was willing to risk, you know, let that helicopter come in, you know, it would have maybe one third, one half. It would be so depleted it couldn't be used again, right? In which case, hey, then I can take advantage of the situation here. But I did use an EW on the last attack to take this hex. Now I've got this unit really badly surrounded. I, you know, most of Hamburg is going to fall is, is basically what it comes down to. But I don't know where I'm going after that. I, th I think I've pretty much depleted everything here. Yeah, this unit didn't get used, but there ain't a hell of a lot I can do with it. I don't think, you know, it, there's no engineer, so the idea of crossing the river into the city there, it's just too ugly, you know? So we'll hold off. That is an unreadable counter. Oh, fuck. Um, but I don't think it's part of the 94th Guard, uh, but I don't know what it is. That may actually be an un allocated artillery um, on top, which may be why I'm not recognizing what it is. But, you know, it, it, it's a lot of effort. There were, what, like three divisions in play here? Still got, still got this unit, but again, I don't think I can do much with it. It's like, <laughs> you have a very, very limited number of attacks you can make. Somebody fucking around in the road. Little push by the first guard tank brushed aside. I don't know what the fuck. Oh, this unit. Oh. <laughs> Which was pretty weak at the time. And then 40th guard tank slid in here to launch an attack against that that didn't do much. But the biggie was that battle, I got the helicopter to commit to one of the rounds of it. And that helicopter is now basically unavailable. Um, it's got one more hit left. It could go in and take a chance of being destroyed, but we don't do that, right? Not with a big seven pointer, <laughs> we just don't. Which means now I'm safe to start considering attacks over here. This guy has got him pinned. No way I wanna play with the Dutch yet. Um, I, I had to drag an artillery from over in the city to here. I could have brought some Polish army artillery, non-divisional stuff into, into play. I've got some helicopters too there, which I probably should bring on the map just because they could be very, very useful in follow-ups or whatever. Uh, but I'm also kind of, gosh, you know, I want to see what develops before I decide where they're going to go. It's just, you know, this sort of paralysis as to which things should go first. Helicopters out of the way, some heavy artillery suppression, and we've pretty much taken this sector here. This guy's actually more of a pain than he looks like. <laughs> um, yeah, I can trace supply back to here, which is cool from there. And then these guys have crossed the river, so they're able to trace off the Bayor map. So that's, that's, but he was causing issues in terms of being able to move my artillery into place and whatnot. Just bypassing him, screw him. <laughs> he's not gonna do much harm once he's on his own. Um, he can try to go somewhere. These guys were basically trying to break out and slide up there. And now that option is kind of not available. So I don't know what the hell they're gonna do. This is done. It's completely worn out, um, but you can see we've made incursions up into here and we're really kind of trying to pocket. Well, we've got a pocket there. The question is, do we reduce it or do we just punch forward? And obviously the answer is punch forward if we can, but leaving that big a pocket might be of some danger. So maybe we need to reduce it. Um, and also it'll help free up uh, these units. So this whole sector is beginning to look a lot better. I don't know if I have much I can do over here, but I keep thinking I don't have much I can do, and then I find things 
that I can grind, especially now that that German helicopter is out of play, the artillery is all out of play down here. It opens up a lot of opportunities, but there aren't a lot of units deployed against the Germans. What do I got here? 35th Division? Where the fuck is the rest of that? Some of it's down here concentrating on those. So I think these guys are just doing a holding action, really. This artillery has already been used uh, for the counter-battery fire. You can't move up into place and counter-battery fire. You can move up to place and do indirect fire and whatnot, but you have to be already positioned to knock out the other guy's artillery so that you can make the attacks you want to. Luckily for me, I've got some here, but the problem is the Brits have their helicopters still. This one's unused. Yeah, it's got one hit on it. This one's got a couple of hits. This one's got a couple of hits. Uh, I think this one cuts out somewhere around here. So I don't know if I can attrib the, art, the uh, helicopters enough to be worth making those attacks. I got lucky with the Germans, you know? <laughs> they have the one big helicopter, that's the pro, well. Two big helicopters, but that one's not in any position to do anything either. Um, they, they have these huge helicopters, which are really, really potent, but so much more fragile, like, they can be committed once or twice, and that's it. <laughs> and then they've got to recover. Whereas the British small helicopters can get not as impressive an impact, and they might get hurt more likely, but I got a lot more places I can play them because they're broken down to smaller units. I don't know which one I... They, they, they both are interesting. It would be nice to have a mixture of them <laughs> for each side or, or be able to do breakdowns with your helicopters and, and build ups and whatnot. The way, they're, uh, the way they're allocated by national, and I assume there's some doctrinal reasons, but I highly doubt that those are all that rigid. I don't know. So here come the poles. <laughs> Unreliability rules. I don't know. I don't remember what they are. They're like, I gotta, I gotta hunt them down. Um, they're not in here. I don't know where they are to tell you the truth, because there are no poles in the first three published games, but I think the rules are in there uh, because the Polish unreliability rules were extended to all the nationalities in the Volkers uh, set. Anyway, I'm looking through here and I can't find anything I can do. So for now at least, I'm going to call it a day. It's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know what I was going to say. <laughs> there were words that were going to come out of my mouth. I don't remember what they were. Uh, but yeah. The something, something, something. I have no fucking clue. There's a lot of board left to cover. Uh, and shit, you know. It's like Wednesday now. Tomorrow's Thursday. If I do anything reasonably, I'll be going shopping, which means... I don't think I'm going to finish this map this week, uh, this, this impulse this week, which is a sad thing, but that's what it is. Um, I feel like I've made a lot of gains over here on the North German Plain, and now what do I have left? I have some very interesting situation on the Fifth Corps map where there's a light line of defense, and I could actually be able to punch through that. Bayor is a lot nastier. I, like I said, this is the only, only real linchpin that I can see for a breakthrough on the Bayor map. I'm really looking more towards hitting from here. This attack was unsuccessful, 
but there might be a possibility of trying to attack here. But, you know, there's a big British column coming in o over in that direction. So you don't see that as too useful. So the, uh, the Brits have the best terrain to defend right now, and they're doing the best. <laughs> Uh, everywhere else, it kind of feels to me like NATO is collapsing across the board. You know, they're, they're holding up okay, given everything, but the, uh, the terrain is not good for them to defend, especially far to the south over there near Austria. Uh, that's going to have to collapse. It's just... Uh, the crappy Czech units and whatnot that are fighting them are kind of wearing down and weren't able to push as hard as maybe they, they could have otherwise. Here, we're breaking through across the river over on the Hof Gap map, and that looks pretty significant. Maybe I'll get something as significant on the Fifth Corps map. I don't know. But I don't see much that's going to affect another map. It's really, you know, kind of like the attack way down in the south, if that happens, that's not going to affect anything. This attack, if anything, it tightens the lineup. So, you know, the Fifth Corps map actually might gain from, um, from this incursion. It's just the Hof Gap map is in horrible shape. Likewise, anywhere where I'm likely to make an expansion towards Frankfurt or whatever, I think the Fifth Corps map uh, is not going to impact Bayor. Uh, the only thing that's going to help is right here. And that, that looks pretty nasty. So that's where I would have liked the poles to go, but they're too far away. And I'm gaining ground here. So let's put pressure in multiple sectors of the front and see, see what can happen. All right, I think that's it for a while. All right, it's nighttime. Nice big moon out there. <laughs> um, and I started trying to wiggle at the lost tooth, or, or wiggle the tooth there to try to get my way through. It doesn't look that bad. I was already across. So I made an attack into here, destroyed the unit that was there uh, with some expenditure, and then started hitting this. That didn't work out so well. I'm just trying to break through in this area that I think is a little weak. Now, there's plenty of room for NATO to fall back here, so it's not like I'm going to get any kind of, you know, advance like I got here, right? <laughs> Where it was like, oh, if I don't fall back, I'm going to lose everything, you know? Uh, but uh, I, I don't have much hope for the Bayor map right now uh, from the Soviet point of view, but... And I'm not really targeting this. I, I looked at it you know, for a good five, 10 minutes, and I, I just can't figure out a way to, way to get it. So trying to, trying to just loosen something up here. I've got another division in, in the background that I could throw in against either of those if they're successful, but again, I don't really expect much on this map. In fact, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. This is not good. If I can clear this road, it gets a lot better. <laughs> so this, this hex becomes really important, and that, that would not be a hard unit for me to get out of there. But you know, as it stands, things are kind of a fucking mess. Here we are on Thursday. Uh, it's so gray out. It's not supposed to rain, but it's supposed to be sunny. At least there's a little sunshine on the app that I see, which might mean not much brighter than this on and it's not like a fog or anything that I get a kick out of it's just gray um, on Monday now I've taken the step hey the wheel is gone yeah I brought the wheels down and actually what I discovered was what I had hoped before but I'm glad I bought another pair of wheels although I'm not these wheels are so these metal wheels are so much heavier but I discovered that I could take the wheel off one of uh, off my old cart, or off the new cart, and back onto the old cart, or something along those lines. I'm not sure which way we're. Uh, actually, I'm using the newer cart right now, but it was the one that lost the wheel earlier, <laughs> or first. Uh, but anyway, 
I've swapped out, out that wheel because what I found was um, it's actually the spring on uh, the cart I've been using more recently that's gone bad. Now that it wrecked the wheel that was on that side, but I couldn't fix the spring either. I mean, I had looked at it and said, huh, fixing the spring doesn't fix the issue. That wheel is fucked. Anyway, I played a lot of Raid last night. I gotta play more today. I basically, I got myself into this cycle where like I'm trying to get something. So I don't know if I'm gonna be able to play much of any of this in the daylight because uh, just doing something that requires so fucking much like <laughs> time in front of the bolt in front of the screen um, but we'll see if, if I can I'll, I'll try to try to finish up this uh, this impulse well, I reevaluated my in-game assets in raid and decided I was probably getting a little too low in something that's very time consuming to use. And on top of that, there's out of game assets like my time. <laughs> so I changed uh, my spending and that gives me, eh, I don't know, a couple hours <laughs> outside of prey that, you know, conceivably I could go shopping, but it, it looks rainy and yucky out. I kind of showed you, but this like wetness everywhere and it should be better. <sighs> Anything to delay a shopping trip, right? I really don't like going food shopping um, or any kind of exiting of the house, it turns out. But I was actually thinking, reading the OCS rules, how badly I'm going to do with that as well. But uh, let's take a look at this. Huh. Oh, there it is. Air interdiction. So, yeah, you can't do it with artillery in this game. But I've totally ignored the capability that the Soviets have had with their air power, to just drop some interdiction and fuck up um, the point, uh, the, the movement capabilities of some of these reinforcements. Let's take a look at that. Maybe it's time like many. You know, again, some people say this is chrome or whatever. To me, it's not. <laughs> you know, to me, this is key to representing this level of detail. And it's kind of sad that I'm just not able to grasp everything and figure out all the different things that I might want to do. Um, and like OCS, you probably have to study this game relatively heavily, the way I did with SFB or whatever, to be able to utilize the system and really get the best effects out of it. But let's take a quick look at it. Um, You spend uh, friction point. You spend air points to put friction points on the map, and the first enemy or stack that enters it will gain those friction points. It feels like it's not that big a deal, and I don't think it affects supply at all, which is kind of the that's kind of the shitty part of it, right? I'm used to interdiction just increasing the movement point cost of a space, but here it actually causes casualties if the enemy chooses to move through it. Now, finding a location that's so valuable that it's worth dropping that on is probably pretty rare. So I don't feel too bad about not using it. But on the other hand, you know, if I could have dropped a couple of them and prevented, you know, the use of a major roadway that would prevent uh, reinforcements from coming up or something along those lines, that would have been a huge win but on the other hand, I would have to be taking on um, thinking like the enemy and figuring out what the fuck they're going to do about the situation <laughs> a lot more than I tend to be able to do. Even when I'm playing opposed, uh, play, playing solo, uh, it's almost impossible because I'm trying very hard not to think about the enemy too much. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
That may explain some of my, my poor play. Anyway, um, I guess we're back to the Bayor map and maybe the Fifth Corps map, trying to figure out how to how, how to, to gain some kind of advantage. These are really expensive. You know, e e each division is basically a major expense mentally to figure out what the fuck I want to do. So. Onward and upward, I guess. Focus is drawn over here, where this unit is incredibly important. It would clear up most, if not all, of my supply issues. But maybe not all of them. What about this guy? One, two, three, four. Five, six. Yeah, he's not gonna... So this piece is actually able to clear up all my supply issues if I get rid of that one piece. Or if I move a unit into this road. That would also work. So that's where I'm going to uh, focus my efforts, my primary efforts that are left on the Bayard map. Uh, I think I have a fair amount of EW on that. I believe I'm over in that eight box. Hard tank, which is really this command here, takes the road position after blasting away that one unit. Yeah, it was at some expense, but not a terrible amount. There was no artillery or helicopters in range, so we were able to bust it up pretty easily. Although this artillery got a little tired. Um, and that's important because it allows me to move the 14th guard up into this position and start threatening things up there. Otherwise, I would have diverted one unit of it, gotten things confused, or else pulled this 27th guard unit down, which I really don't want to do. Uh, that might actually be operating you know, against here instead. I don't know. Although this looks like the weak spot, so I think I, I want to hit that if possible. Um, and then uh, looking a little bit further, I can see the 7th East German. I'd like to do something about that piece, but I don't really know. Like, I can't do anything about it this turn. I'm not in position to do so, and my lead units are up here, and maybe I'd be better off just trying to push further up. Um, but leaving units in the back areas is more and more dangerous, although one unit can't do a lot of damage. What if I strand another one, you know? 14th Guard got itself into a kind of a weird situation. I uh, punched into an artillery unit. I think it's this one here. It better have some hits on it. Yeah, it has a lot of hits on it. Um, I punched into the artillery unit that was back here. It was kind of exposed. And in doing so, pushed it back, took another shot on it, um, and ended up pinning this artillery as well as throwing this one back. So I moved the rest of the 14th Guard up to attack this. Now, I left this poor guy stranded out of supply, which sucks, to be honest. But <laughs> I don't think there's much that NATO can do to, uh, to this unit. It's just he's not going to recover unless NATO manages to pull out. I tried to beat up on this. I thought this would be the weak spot, but you know, it's got a three defense against normal attack and against mobile. So uh, there wasn't, in the terrain it was in, I, I just couldn't hit it on kind of a, a moving attack. Um, I found out I have a couple of engineers over here. I really ought to divert one of them somewhere else. I don't know where, <laughs> but... I don't need two up in this area. There's no river line to cross. I'm running out of cities uh, in this area, so I might actually dispatch both of them elsewhere. It's this castle looked like it might be a problem, so I think twice I threw an engineer up there to do something about it. Um, am I running out of stuff to do? I still have this I can deal with. I still have a bunch of stuff back here to cope with. Uh, especially these units that are, you know, still, still kind of reserves that haven't, haven't made their way onto, you know, into the combat yet. So we shall see if I can clear this. That opens paths, but 
it's hard to see what I want to do because I don't want to go up against this shit. But this is pretty heavily contested already. This I feel like I'm dealing with as well as I can. I, I don't really need another division there. I might need one up here. That leaves me one more division that I'll probably pump in here. I feel like I got a hole there that NATO's not going to do anything about it, but there is some kind of nice terrain uh, for the attacker, I guess. Not really. I mean, the defender's in good terrain everywhere, so I don't see, I don't see much gain, unless I can get a breakthrough here. And I do have a reserve division for that, you know, uh, mainly by avoiding Hanover, or at least hitting it from the east. I've... Uh, I've left myself a lot of troops, but not a lot of opportunities and places to, to strike. But I feel like I'm doing fine on the Bayer map, you know? Because of the Fifth Corps map, I'm almost off map as it is. Again, I, I really don't think you can take the multi-map. I'm feeling a little faint. Uh, I've eaten, I don't, I think it's the coffee that I had. Uh, Shit happens like that, so I may need to break, even though, you know, I say, hey, I've got two hours. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't because I can spend like a half hour playing and then that's moving a division or two. And then it's like, yeah, okay, I got to break. <laughs> I did eat. And it's so fucking dark. I, uh, um, but, uh, now I feel like not the same faintness, just this incredible lethargy. Uh, so I don't know. I probably shouldn't have eaten and just laid down and rested because I, I didn't need food. But this happens to me every now and then. It is Friday, pretty enough day that, you know, I would probably try to at least convince myself to go shopping. But. It is, of course, Friday. Precludes me, and it's, it's a shame it's going to rain. I mean, look, I'm not going to be in any shape tomorrow anyway. Oh, Sunday's supposed to be pretty. I doubt I'd make it out on Sunday either. But um, anyway, I've got some raid playing in the background. Starting to look at the Bayor map. I made a couple of moves over here and here. And... I'm at kind of a point where I want to understand what resources I have left before I make a decision to attack there. And I want to understand the success of that attack before I move any of my reserves. Which to me means we go back over to the 5th Corps map and then uh, pick up what we can here. Because this attack, so I can launch an attack from up here. It could be incredibly successful, highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. But who knows what the enemy is going to do. Um, and. Oh, hi. <laughs> do, 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 do. Yes. <laughs> and now the, he, he makes his little jump. Oh, no. He's going a different way. Oh, well. Ah. Uh, this is so cute. Oh, uh, now he's making his way down. Yeah, sometimes, quite often they jump right to that tree. This is just like a highway, but he seems to be exploring for food instead. Okay, where the hell am I? Yeah, um, I want to see if there's anything more that I can eke out of the center of the Fifth Corps map, uh, because I think the odds of this doing much is very low. I'm putting the squeeze on in here. I'm, I'm looking at this as a major possible avenue of attack, but again, the Bayor map is not one where I'm going to get a lot of gains. And again, like down here, maybe some mop-up down here will happen. I don't know what the hell is going on, because i got tons of artillery over there. <laughs> and it's kind of exposed, you know, but it's like, yeah, but a NATO attack would be so foolhardy. <laughs> And probably not do much. You know, the, the Soviets would just retreat or take some casualties, and 
uh, counterattacks just don't seem like they're in in the cards, at least yeah, for the, this scenario at all. So I decided to launch an attack here. I could get like a five to one attack with uh, gas and smoke mobile. EW support. I've hit it twice. Drained a couple of points off this attack helicopter. So far I've taken a hit. My artillery, you know, is each down a couple of points. Uh, one of them is providing the gas and smoke. One of them is providing an extra point just so that I can reserve air points. Um, but now I'm at a state where I have to make a decision, you know, do I want to just keep battering through? This isn't a bad attack. If it is successful, instead of being here, um, it would be four over, one, two, three, four. It would be here, but it's also not a great attack. I'm probably not going to get the breakthrough, especially after these attacks. So I think I'm going to just call it off. Although, it's kind of neat that I'm draining the helicopters, right? Because the helicopter has to come in, these artillery have to come in, in both cases. Of course, I could bring a different helicopter in or something, but um, uh, a second helicopter, but that, that would be a serious waste of, of effort. I can get it down to one to one with using these artillery, but uh, there's also the, okay, look, you know, the artillery is going to recover its hits. The helicopter is, okay, I don't know, you know. Um, if I had other attacks that I, I really wanted to do, it, it would make some sense. And maybe I will find others, but it just, it, it feels like I'm not going to get um, the kind of forward motion that I really desire off of this attack. Like if I could, if I could have knocked this guy back, if I got very, very lucky, on multiple attacks. I could knock him back and, you know, start punching forward and then shift a, a tank unit over and whatnot. Right now I'm not seeing any kind of result of that nature. And it might be better to hold off, hope for the best, um, and, and, and set up for uh, a set piece battle there. Up operations are kind of a pain when you don't surround the enemy. I've surrounded the enemy in most of these, but this guy, I tried to slam him from, uh, from the west, and it just drives him down further east. You know, <laughs> there's not much can do. I think I have to commit a division to take him out, uh, which is a shame. I would have liked to have shifted this up here, but, and, and, you know, be healthy and fresh, but this one unit is just too damn annoying. I don't have to throw the whole division into play. I mean, this unit is, it's just an artillery piece, uh, but it's still got two defense, and it's nasty. <laughs> My life's a lot easier if instead of advancing, advancing back to where I was, I follow this guy and take a position, because now maybe one unit can crush him. I'm not sure. The positioning is still kind of annoying. Let's just go here instead. So that way I can come from here, get him surrounded. He's not going to retreat. Because it's the retreats that are the problem. It's kind of important to hunt him down because there's this big gap here. And I don't think he had a supply route because there's like zones of control along the road in various places. But he wasn't far from one. And certainly with another, if he had taken an opportunity move, he could have escaped. So it's kind of important to whack him, and we did so. Um, so we're also developing what the line is going to look like up here. Uh, over here, 20th guard, 23rd tank, 11th guard has moved up to there. And I moved 39th guard up to here. The big question for me was, does 39th guard go this way or this way? Again, I feel like the 5th Corps map is the important one. Like, if I can get a breakthrough on the 5th Corps map, that kind of makes the gains on these other maps make more, yeah, be of more importance or something. I don't know. Because the thing is, as long as I'm like leveraging 5th Corps to get into the Bayor and the Hofgap maps, I'm kind of cheating, you know? And what we're looking at is how far west did I get? Well, it's sort of a slope 
you know, <laughs> right? It's not a, it's not, it, you can't judge it just by the map lines. The map lines themselves tell me, well, you know, I'm like a tweezer span away from the edge of the board here and here. This is closer to the fifth core map in terms of distance. This is a little more than a tweezer span. Yeah, that's how we measure things around here. Um, I don't know. It's what I have at hand. Um, so, you know, we're seeing sort of a, a, a general success on the two maps to the sides of the fifth core map. Maybe on this one where, you know, effort was made to break uh, through the Bayor map. But we're not seeing that kind of success over here on Donau Front, and we're not seeing it on the fifth core. And the furthest west we've gotten is here. So how do you judge that? Well, it's been a little over four turns. The four turn limit was this line. So we're doing well on every map, as far as I'm concerned, but as the Soviets. Uh, one interesting thing, or maybe not that interesting, so I've had to dig into the ones and twos out of my white counter bag again. Um, I didn't have to do it at all last turn. I, I had to do it in the first two turns. I think the last couple turns I've had enough. Now, maybe because there's just more, more units on the board, especially more Soviet units, that we're, we're finding that, yeah, <laughs> Enough stuff has those. Plus, some of the more damaged units are, recover, are recovered, so they, they ate up a lot of the ones and twos um, while, while they're waiting. So, yeah. I think we're back to the, the Bayor map, and really this comes down to, can they launch an attack there? Well, the attacks on this unit didn't go at all well. Uh, sounds like I'm doing my Robert Kennedy uh, voice impression here. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I, I know I mentioned on Facebook, I don't think I mentioned here, every morning when I wake up, it's sort of this cry of anguish. And I mean, it's vocal, it, it just comes out. Uh, and I, I don't even know what it is. It, like, once upon a time, I knew, you know, my dreams were all, and I, back when my first wife left me, my dreams were that things were often that things were okay, that, that I was still there. I don't feel like I've got that in my dream, but what I do feel is that I interact with people in my dreams and I don't interact with people in my real life. And maybe, maybe that's, that's what's uh, hitting me now. I don't know, um, I, but it's just like, you know, waking up and realizing reality exists <laughs> is sort of the problem. There was a long period where this wasn't happening, basically, but now there's a long period where it is happening, where reality again is so ugly. Um, I have some potentials for attacks from the 20th tank there. I had wanted to rest these and maybe do a, a mass attack next impulse, because I don't see much gain to making that attack, honestly. Uh, so I think, oh, I got this thing to deal with, but I'm pretty close to being done. I think I've dealt with all the major things. I have to make some decisions on these divisions. I want to clear the, the way for this. Uh, I really would have liked a breakthrough, obviously, but the chances were basically none. I wish that the pressure that I had put on the NATO forces had weakened this line a little bit more. Then committing to hit it would make sense. There, I've checked that piece so many times because it's a weak piece but it's in a very strong location. But it's a weak piece with you know, gaps around it and whatnot that looks like I could exploit. And that might, be, that might be where I go for anyhow, simply because, I don't know. It, it depends on what the odds are, right? You know, because uh, 
this is twice as big on defense against mobile and a little bigger on normal defense. Uh, but in clear terrain, and if I hit that, like what's the difference, right? What's the difference of twice as much? Well, it depends on how bad my odds are. If my odds are not bad, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot of shifts, you know. But if my odds are shitty, if they're down in the in the two to one, three to one era area, it may only be a shift of one, and the terrain means more. And it all it all uh, it all depends on what's hitting it. All right. I'll focus on those, I guess. One of those three big divisions, and it might have made sense to like send one of the divisions up this way, because the fifth core map has bled troops into uh, the other maps. Not so much into here, but definitely into here. But I'm hoping that those troops find their way back. Because <laughs> uh, things are definitely very sparse over here. It might have sent, made sense to send a division up this way. But I sent one in this way, one here. Uh, 47th guard tank was still kicking around here. Third guard tank came up here to engage this. And I've got no reserve in case there's a breakthrough here. I'm okay with that. I'm putting a lot of pressure. This, this is actually the hex that I think I'm gonna be attacking. Even if it's a less valuable, um, even if it's a less of a good odds, I don't know which way that would go, but it was easier to get to, but more importantly, the gains are so much more valuable. Um, in, in that direction. So, you know, NATO has to do something to cover that. If that falls, it's very, very bad. Uh, whereas if this falls, in a way, I'm just pinning this uh, more than I'm, I'm actually attacking it. So we're throwing a lot of force on the Bayor map, hoping to get some serious breakthroughs. We made some good ground on the Fifth Core map, as far as I'm concerned. And I don't know. <laughs> With relatively limited forces, like, I mean, just look at the line here. Okay, ignore the fact that I got a nice big gap here, but just look at this line, right? And now, let's look at the fifth core line. Uh, <laughs> but NATO is also responding or is positioned. There's a lot of troops on the Bear map, and a lot of them belonged there. You can tell by the British color. You don't see a lot of US units there. You see some of these German units, I think they drifted over, um, weakening the line over here. And I think some of the US units drifted this way as well. But yeah, this is really solidly defended. The only, the only problem has been, you know, the, the center of the map is solidly defended. The only problem has been where the incursion from Fifth Corps happened. And that's where sort of the spill out has come and both sides have thinned their lines there. Uh, I still have, what, some, some artillery resources to figure out what the hell I'm gonna do with. Those need to go where they're gonna be most useful. Duh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in, in particular, where uh, counter battery fire is gonna be of value. Now, what I've seen is that we've got some long range guns that could do something to some of these German artillery. And I, I think that's gonna be at least some of it. And some of the rest, I may throw to where I'm expecting the fight to be. But honestly, I don't need a lot of short range guns. It's, uh, it's guys like this that I really need on, on the line. All right, I just performed sort of a check, make sure I've got everything in place. I think, I think I'm good with everything. It's hard to tell with this game. Uh, I kind of did the trace of the lines with you a little bit earlier, so I don't think I need to go into too much detail on that. Uh, pay much attention over here for some reason, but whatever. So I think we're ready to load this up. This is the end of turn five, the first Soviet impulse. I've been doing these AB 
A being that first Soviet impulse, the attack is, you know, intense. Whereas the defense is usually doesn't have a lot of doesn't have any combats in it so far, and has just been hey I'm dev uh, designing a line or uh, I'm, I'm redeveloping my line back here, and then I just do the rest of the turn, which is usually almost nothing, you know. So yeah, in terms of resources, that's something I didn't mention. So for the second possible Soviet impulse, we got a couple EW on the Bayar map. I don't know that I want to make any attacks. Uh, well, we've used up the EW on the North German plain. We've got quite a bit of EW everywhere else. And we've got six air points. I, I try to reserve air points. And in fact, I even like over fire artillery probably. Is it likely from what I've seen, certainly in the last couple days or whatever, which has been focusing on these maps, I don't remember seeing anywhere where I looked and said, ha, huh, I'm probably going to want to do follow-up attacks there. But those six air points give me a little bit of reserve, um, especially if you're running ahead of your artillery and whatnot on an advance, you may find you need some. So what the hell? It's not a big deal that I saved. Saved a few. Or that I end up wasting them is basically the real, real concern here. Saving them is a good thing. Having wasted them is the bad thing. Same thing with the EW points, although the EW points, honestly, you got to have a decent attack for it to make any sense. Um, but the idea of like just pressing the enemy with more rounds of combat, well, combat might make sense. With more rounds of movement is very, very difficult to... to uh, to justify because you're even with you know even if you're getting decent odds attacks or, or whatever or good ground you're burning resources faster on those secondary uh, phases all right we'll load this up uh, and it's cool it's Friday I got done with it <laughs> now I want to take a nap or something I mean I got like a couple hours before I have to go back to playing raid. I have to go through downtown today because I gotta check to deposit actually. These are kind of annoying. I mean, this is a, a decent amount of money, but um, I just have like, I've been having trouble getting things to go into my bank automatically. Uh, I don't know why, but like, you know, I've, I've got these dividends that come in and these are really pathetic. They're like three bucks every quarter or something. You know? It's like 10 bucks or less every quarter, whatever. And I really should get rid of the stock. But um, that would require action, you know. And, and I have to, you know, go out of my way on my way to the bar to, to hit the bank and by, by a significant distance. But yeah, this is uh, my dad sent me a Christmas present, which he does every year, and whatever. Which is a little bit more reasonable than having to make that walk for a few bucks. But the thing is, I have to pay taxes on that few bucks, and you know, I'm not gonna just throw it away, <laughs> even if like it would make sense. Well, one interesting thing, I thought I did just throw it away. Uh, they have like a 90-day time limit on them. And those are bullshit in almost every case. There was one case where I, I think the 90 day time limit did count. I got like, uh, I was involved in a class action suit over, you know, a computer monitor. I got like, it was not a, a, an insignificant amount of money. I don't know, but it was like 20 bucks or less. You know, I mean, it wasn't a decent amount. Um, and uh, depositing that. I, I actually was worried about because they said the fund itself would go away, you know, as opposed to like uh, with the dividends and whatnot, they're just processing it through a company. And basically that 90 days is just a CYA in case they switch processors or something. In which case, oh, too bad. I lost three bucks, you know. <laughs> All right. Up it goes.